Okay, well, thank you, Dennis, and Happy New Year to everyone. And I'm glad you're with us today because we have a lot to discuss. And I want to begin by picking up on what you heard from Lyndon LaRouche about political parties. What we're dealing with is something that is bigger than an election, something bigger than political parties. You know, some people have the view that the Democratic Party itself was responsible for this. From my many years in Texas, we had a saying that the Democratic Party couldn't organize a two car funeral procession. And if you look at the problems Pelosi is having, uh, what you see is that this thing was organized from higher up. We also know that Joe Biden couldn't be the author of this because he's barely the author of his own salutations when he does his two minute press conferences. So we have to ask the question, who can pull off something like the vote fraud that we're going to be discussing? And I'm gonna just say a few things about it because the panel is much more capable of addressing it because we have people who were there, who were witnesses, who are members of state legislatures, who have had hearings and, and can talk about it much more than I can. But who could pull off something like this and why? And what we have to look at is who are the historic enemies of the United States that have the motivation and the capability to do this? And the best way to look at that is from the standpoint of what is the policy that will be put in place if this vote theft is allowed to stand. Let me just give you a, a little hint of that from some comments in the last days, first of all, from Prince Charles. And many people are, are not familiar with the importance of Prince Charles of the House of Windsor as a figure, but he's been a leading advocate of global population reduction for his whole life. Uh, following in the footsteps of his father, Prince Philip of the World Wildlife Federation. Uh, Prince Charles did an interview with the BBC the other day, and he just laid it out. He said, we have to look to protect and sustain Mother Earth. That's what is sacred. And he said, we have to adopt the wisdom of indigenous peoples. Now, this is really something coming from someone from the House of Windsor, whose fortune was built on the exploitation of indigenous peoples and kept them poor and uneducated and underdeveloped in colonial uh, systems so they could be looted more easily. What is the wisdom he's talking about? He's talking about how they have tamed the indigenous populations and used them now as they're out to destroy advanced modern civilization. And, and Prince Charles has been at the head of the fight for a global reset a policy of zero carbon, what's called the Great Reset. One of his partners in, in this is Klaus Schwab of the World Economic Forum, the so-called Davos Group. Uh, Schwab co-hosted with Prince Charles on November 9th and 11th, an event in the city of London where they laid out the strategy for the Great Reset as the imposition by use of financial manipulation of a Green New Deal for the world. And he's going to be hosting on January 27th and 28th, the Green Horizons Summit, which is a Davos event, which will take this up. What he said in an interview or in an op-ed the other day is 2021 will be the year zero. And this is their intent. So, so just listen to these words. We're going to have an end to carbon-based economic activity, he said, through the beginning of a government private sector cooperation for a net zero target for greenhouse gas emissions, moving the world to a virtuous cycle of decarbonization. Now, Schwab then went on to cite the incoming, he hopes, Biden presidency, which you, our viewers, have something to do with making sure it doesn't happen. But he cites that potential for an incoming Biden presidency along with commitments from the European Union, from Japan, from China, as evidence of the power of the global climate movement. Now, we saw some of that power the other day with the congressional budget, and you didn't hear much about it because it was buried in the budget. The 2021 budget includes a commitment for zero carbon. That is, the U.S. Congress is going along with the Davos crowd and this great reset. 
So if this fraud in the election stands, it will represent the final recapture of the United States by the London-centered financial interests who have always been the enemy of the American system and the American Republic. And I'm going to give you an insight into this from Lyndon LaRouche, who fought his whole life to restore the American Republic to the traditions of Franklin, of Hamilton, of the Constitution, and who identified throughout our history the battles we had to fight with forces that were tied to the city of London, the free trade policies, the uh, uh, colonial policies, the anti-industrial policies, which today believe that they're standing on the verge of completing the wreckage of an economic system of energy dense systems, which is necessary to sustain the seven plus billion people on the planet. In other words, their goal they think is within reach to reduce the world population dramatically. Now, here's what Lyndon LaRouche had to say, and I'm going back now to almost 20 years ago. He made a forecast in January of 2001 when George Bush first came into office. Remember, the Bush Gore election was not settled for over a month until a Supreme Court ruling on Florida gave the election to Bush. And what LaRouche said in January of 2001 is that there's no way that Bush will be able to address the economic crisis that, is, uh, that is, exists in the country. Remember, we had a collapse of the dot-com bubble in 2000, and before that, a collapse of the uh, so-called economic tigers of Asia, and then a Russian bond crisis with LTCM, long-term capital management, that nearly collapsed the banking system. So when Bush was coming in, there were two aspects of the Bush-Cheney policy. And in looking at that, LaRouche said, there's no way they can do this without a Reichstag fire type event, which would give them emergency powers to impose the kind of corporatist, fascist economic policy and war policy that goes with it. Now, that was his forecast in January 2001. And we saw what happened in September 2001. Now, in reflecting back on this, in a webcast he did on January 24th, 2002, he made the following comments. He said, talking of his forecast, we can understand the future. We cannot understand always or predict what events will occur, but we can foresee the conditions into which we are heading. And we can discuss the conditions, what they mean, how we should deal with them, and what the likely response is to these various proposals, proposed actions. Now, he then talked about his January 2001 forecast, and he said there were three major points that he was trying to get across. First, the economic issue, that the United States was constituted as a republic based on principles of the physical economy, the American system, which were designed by Alexander Hamilton in conjunction with Benjamin Franklin, with George Washington, with a number of others, with the intention to make us an industrial republic that was connected by modern infrastructure, that had a viable uh, financial system based on what? On physical goods production and science and technology, which would allow for advances in productivity. And what LaRouche said in 2001, what he saw was that we were heading into an accelerated economic collapse. The post-1971 economic system, the destruction of the Bretton Woods system, created a series of bubbles and then crashes that were caused by slashing investments into the physical economy and the move at the same time to financial innovation, which is essentially a term for speculation. Additionally, connected to that was a move away from sovereign nation states with an ability to make economic policy for the sake of their people. Instead, we were seeing economic policy being made on behalf of global central banks and the largest banking institutions. So that was the economic crisis he saw in 2001. Secondly, he said, what was the motive of 9-11? It was to begin a state of permanent global warfare 
This was based on the British doctrine that was developed by uh, Sir Bernard Lewis, uh, furthered by Samuel Huntington from Harvard with his clash of civilizations policy, and then carried forward by Zbigniew Brzezinski with his commitment to encirclement of Russia and China by terrorist Islamic organizations that would destroy those countries and lead to regime change. What Lynn said is this is classic British geopolitics, going back to the great game of the 1860s through uh, the 20th century and the geopolitics that led to two world wars. And he said in the United States, this would be accompanied by a move towards what became known as the surveillance state, the security state, the use of new technologies, cyber technologies, to monitor the activity and the thinking of the American people and to control them through what we know today as social media and similar type systems. Now, the third point he made is what was the precedent for this? And he referred to the Reichstag fire, which was used by the Nazis for their own emergency decree, which led to the police state and dictatorship under Hitler. Now, what he said about that is if you look at this, while it was under Hitler that it was done, it was on behalf of the Anglo-American interests that were behind Hitler. And he identified a number of individuals, and I'll just mention the names now, and you can look these up and, and study them and go back to work that we have on the LaRouche uh, organization site and LaRouche pub where you can find this. One was Montague Norman, the head of the Bank of England. And it was Norman who was very much involved in pulling together the financial interests that supported the takeover of power by Adolf Hitler. You had a group of American-based and British-based cartels, the Standard Oil Trust, the Rockefeller Cartel. You had banking interests such as the Harriman family, the Union Bank Corporation of New York, which had on its board Roland Harriman and Prescott Bush, the father of, for, of uh, future President George Herbert Walker Bush, and the grandfather of George W. Bush. And you had British banking interests and they were tied to German interests such as the Schroeder's Bank, uh, as well as the Rothschild banks, uh, so other international banks like Lazard Frere. And then finally, you had the person who was put in place to carry out the economic policy, Yalmar Schacht. Now, why going through, why, why go through this background? Well, Given what Lyndon LaRouche said about parties, that political parties are worthless, who's organizing these transformations? And what must be done to stop them and carry out a counter transformation back to the American system? And what we're looking at is a monetary financial side of things and a strategic side. And he laid out on the monetary financial side, what he called the new Bretton Woods, moving to an physical economy of goods production, not just in the United States and Europe, but we saw what we saw after World War II, what Franklin Roosevelt did in the post-war period and what the United States did to spark the reconstruction of the devastated countries of Europe, Japan, with the idea that this would be spread to the colonial world. That was Roosevelt's vision, which was sabotaged by the British at the end of the war when they reimposed a colonial system. The strategic side of this that LaRouche identified is the need for sovereign nation states to work together to overcome the power of the city of London, Wall Street and related interests. And those sovereign nation states primarily identified by LaRouche were the United States, Russia and China. And the intent of the utopian military policy of endless war was to pit the United States against Russia and China, and possibly Russia and China against each other, to prevent that from occurring, that kind of global alliance, global cooperation. And what have we had since 2001, what LaRouche was talking about? We've had endless wars, permanent warfare. We've had bubbles, crashes, and bailouts. And after each crash, the people who caused the crash get bailed out. The families that suffer from the crash of productive workers end up with nothing, losing homes, losing jobs, losing health care. We've had a further reduction of physical goods production 
as our industrial base has been looted and much of our agriculture has been turned from the virtue of family farming into global cartels that can control world food supply. And then finally, the global domination of Malthusian quackery, with Malthus having been an operative of the British East India Company, a predecessor to Prince Philip and Prince Charles, who argued that population will always outstrip, population growth will always outstrip the means to take care of it, to pro provide a standard of living to sustain it. Therefore, mass exterminations will take place. And in fact, those should be welcomed as a way of culling the hurt human herd. That's the British system. That's the system that was put in place under George W. Bush and under Barack Obama. What happened in 2016 was a rebellion against that. Now, most people don't know the details, but you can, uh, people know that they didn't like the policies they were hearing from what they saw with Bush, what they saw with Obama. And when they saw Hillary Clinton as the next step in that, they voted for Donald Trump. And when Trump came in, he had an echo of LaRouche's policies, the opposition to the free trade agreements, which stripped our industry, opposition to the Paris Climate Accord, which was going to destroy energy production in the United States, opposition to the permanent warfare, and a desire to have friendly cooperative relationships with Russia and China. This was a threat to this global banker elite, this establishment that was pushing for the next phase of the destruction of sovereign nation states to dissolve sovereign nation states into being vassals of a global corporate cartel of energy companies, banking and finance, uh, food production, big pharma, and so on, where the policies would be made at the top. Now, this is what the Great Reset is. The Great Reset essentially says we can't allow elected governments to make spending policy because they're too much affected by the needs of their constituents. Well, what is the constitutional republic that the United States is, but a government which is supposed to respond to the needs of its constituents. And we elect our representatives with that intent that they will make policy that will provide for our needs today and, and the future by giving us both the freedom and the credit that is the capability to make investments in science and technology to develop the new technologies that we need for the future. That's what was attacked when President Trump came in. Now, one of the people who coordinated Trump's campaign, Roger Stone, said that Lyndon LaRouche was the backdrop for the Trump campaign. Now, what did we see happen to Donald Trump? He got what people called the LaRouche treatment, including from some of the same people, like the Washington Post, NBC News, the mainstream media, that slandered and attacked LaRouche for years, went after Donald Trump with the same line, authoritarian, anti-Semite, racist. Now, additionally, Robert Mueller, who became the special counsel in the Russiagate investigation, had been the lead prosecutor in Boston in the initial Get LaRouche task force. Coincidence? I don't think so. If you know the nature of the enemy of the United States, you know that LaRouche was attacked because he was working with Ronald Reagan to bring the United States into collaboration with the Soviet Union to develop anti-missile defense systems to end the danger of thermonuclear war. Isn't that exactly what Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin were discussing in Helsinki when the media hijacked their summit into a, a loyalty test who does Trump believe, the US intelligence services or Putin? Trump said Putin. And you know what? He was right because the intelligence services that said that the Russians uh, carried out a collusion with Trump to steal the 2016 election, they were all wrong. There never was Russian hacking, Russian collusion, uh, and there never was an operation by Putin to control the United States. There was only 
the tradition of the American constitutional republic that Donald Trump was trying to fulfill by making collaborative relations with people who otherwise would be the enemies under a continuation of a Bush-Obama policy. So what did we have? We had Russiagate, we had Ukraine impeachment, we now have blame China for everything, and what's going on behind the scenes is the global reset, which is something that Donald Trump opposes. Now, when you look at it from this standpoint, and get a sense of the bigger picture, what stands out most importantly? You have to know your enemy, which is something that LaRouche taught us going back to the beginnings of our movement in the anti-war movement in the late 60s, where he accused most of us of being naive and, and foolish and thinking that somehow you can oppose a war by marching around with signs. He said, you need to know why this is happening, who's behind it, and how to change it. One of the advantages we have, which you'll hear from some of the people who are speaking today, is that we now know a lot about who this enemy is. From Russiagate, we've had the exposure of the whole British side of it, from Hannigan of GCHQ, who first brought the fraudulent documents claiming the Russians were preparing a cyber hack against the US election. We, we know of, of Christopher Steele, a so-called former MI6 operative, who, by the way, was working with the whole Biden-Obama team in the 2014 coup that took place in Ukraine. That same Christopher Steele was then hired by the Clintons to draft the fraudulent document, which was behind the Russiagate charges, that gave the FISA courts uh, the opportunity to issue warrants to spy on the Trump campaign. We know of people like Joseph Mifsud, Stefan Halper, and their role in targeting Flynn and, and Carter Page and Papadopoulos and others. We know how the Congress worked through people like Adam Schiff to put these lies into the circulation through the mainstream media, but not allowing the declassification of documents, which would show that these were lies. So we know a lot. And some of this was, was just as an example in the Gateway Pundit the other day in, in an article by Joe Hoft, he pointed to the fact that these documents must be declassified and publicly released. And he said, because many of them point to something that people don't know about too well, that is the orchestrator of this, the United Kingdom. So we have some work to do to win this fight. The first part of it is to, to stop the election theft. And between now and the 6th, people should be making calls to state legislators, calls to Congress, marching, mobilizing, talking about this. But there are other steps that can be made to build this case much more powerfully. And that includes making sure that these documents are publicly released, the documents of Russiagate, which show the criminal conspiracy of the Obama intelligence community people like Brennan and Clapper, working together with the British to rig up the fake story of Russiagate. Those documents must be released. And by the way, while we're releasing documents, how about the 9-11 documents? How about the JFK assassination documents? All of this should come out to show how the intelligence community in the United States has been hijacked by British intelligence working directly under the Queen because the British intelligence services are not controlled by the parliament, but the monarchy. Secondly, appoint a special counsel. You know, there's been massive evidence, and you'll hear from some of the people who have compiled it, uh, people who were there when they weren't allowed to observe, people who saw things that were suspicious and irregular, uh, things that should have been stopped, uh, not certification of signatures and, and finding that there are dead people who are still on the voter rolls. All of these things should have been investigated, but no court in the United States has done that yet. So now it's not before the Congress on January 6th. Will they do that? Well, let's get a special prosecutor that will continue to look into this because it's not just this election, it's the system that's at stake. And then finally, pardon Julian Assange and Edward Snowden to get the story out of what was done that LaRouche was talking about in January 2001, the operation to use wars 
that were based on lies, as Assange exposed in WikiLeaks, to use these cyber capabilities to spy on Americans, to spy on the world, to rig elections in other countries, and to bring those capabilities back here. Just to cite Roger Stone again in a conversation not that long ago, Roger said, look, you can find all kinds of fraud from the urban political machines run by the Democrats. That's a historic given. But the real fraud in 2020 is hidden in the, the computers and the systems, the cyber systems of the CIA, the NSA, and the uh, uh, FBI. And he said that has to come out. Edward Snowden can bring some, something to bear in, in presenting that, as people like Bill Binney have done. So additionally, one final point, crucial point, exonerate Lyndon LaRouche. Because if you go back to the beginning of this period, which I would say goes back to the Kennedy assassination and accelerated every step of the way in 1971, in the 2001 period, in the crash of 2008, we're dealing with a criminal cabal that carried out actions to destroy the American constitutional republic. And if we get turned into a banana republic, what hope is there for the rest of the world? So when I say this is bigger than just an election, it really is the profound test for the American people. Will we step up to the challenge from Benjamin Franklin to keep our republic? So thank you. That's, that's what I have to say.